Hey, greetings, people of the Most High God. Kenneth Hammond's here, Kenneth Hammond the first. Say, have you ever wondered why you can't seem to get a hold on the future? How you, you, you try to get it, but it sometimes eludes you? Have you ever tried, even though you know God has called you to the future, you can't seem to live in it or get there? Well, we're gonna talk about that today in this spiritual discipline in healthy habits. Of uh, These are habits for Christians to develop. All right, let's take a look at this right now. Yes, I am glad to see you today, great people of God. Here we go. I hope you're able to receive this. It's going to be kind of personal. Planning the future, your life in future tense, the four Ps for creating your future. Oh, I said it. What? Creating the future? Well, how can I create my future? Ah, we're going to talk a little bit about that. It's uh, in, in our West Angeles uh, discipline, spiritual discipline, it's number 34. And it's part of the wisdom, spiritual disciplines, embracing God's wisdom for every day. This is an everyday thing we want you to take a look at. So let's move right along here. Ah, spiritual discipline 34, planning for the future. Uh-oh, look at this one, developing habits for creating the future. Release being paralyzed by the past and terrorized by the future. Some people are so afraid of the future. Oh my, the future, I'm so afraid. Ah, hey, look at this, paralyzed. By the way, that's sleep oh, paralyzed. Sometimes you might have hit it. They say many people do, or you can't move sometimes at night. And there you go, terrorized, terrorized by the future. Now, here we go. Here's a philosophical concept. I hope you can bring it right into actuality. Seeing the actualization of potentiality. You have the potential to do so much and be so much, but you can only do that in the future. You need to start it now, but you can only actualize in the future. So you say, that sounds pretty deep. Matter of fact, that's kind of what Aristotle talked about. Well, let's take a look at it this way. Ain't becomes is. It ain't now, but it is going to be. And you know about our spiritual disciplines chart, the 52. Now, our main scripture is kind of tied to what we did about the past, but we go further. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, that is, to have reached perfection. <clears throat> Verse 12, that is from. But one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal. Here we go. I press toward the goal. This is the future tense for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Ah, move forward. Yes, move forward. Keep moving forward. Hey, someone said, if you can't fly, then run. If you can't run, then walk. If you can't walk, then crawl. But whatever you do, you have to keep moving forward. That's Dr. Martin Luther King. No matter what, keep moving forward. Here are the four Ps for creating your future. Now, I want you to remember these, the four Ps. Remember especially the one, because then that gets into the three. Purposeful striving, purposeful striving. We're going to tell you what purposeful means, yes, but we're going to talk about prayer, planning, and persistence. Just very quickly, you know what those are, but those are the three components. Hey, Paul said, I pursue the goal. That is the future. Hmm, here we are, the four Ps. We'll give you some insights into the ministry life of, of Paul, the Apostle Paul. He was a man on target for creating his future and laying the foundation for Christianity's future growth for 2,000 years, purposeful, striving, creates the future. You want to create the future? future? Well, take a look at purpose and then strive. Anyway, here's a threefold Pauline process. Forgetting, talked about that last time, or you can take a look at verse 13, forgetting those things which are behind, anticipating and reaching forth. He had Two things going on at the same time. He said, we're getting, and then reaching forward to those things which are ahead, then press forward, press toward the goal. That is, oh, if you look at the Greek words, you're going to have some fun looking at them. But one of the words is pursue. But if you check it out in my favorite resource, Bible Hub, just put in this 314. You'll see it up Philippians. This is diligent, persistent focus with an eye on the prize. Diligent, persistent focus with your eye on the prize. When you take your eye off the prize and start looking at what's going on around you, you can't win. You can't run. You can't do anything. You can't drive. You can't think if you're dealing with things 
behind and around you. All right, feel it, see it. Can't you just feel and see the intensity here? This apostle, he wants to get the gospel out. He wants to heal, he wants to teach, he wants to encourage, and he wants to get to work with the people of God in his mission. Can't you, can't you kind of feel it? Where was Paul? He was in prison. He should have been saying, oh, woe is me. Oh, my future, oh, I had oh, my future, too bad. No, he was more focused then and did some great writing of the epistles like this one that we have our passage from. Philippians. Here are the words that Paul uses as he vividly describes his passion. These are words that are from Greek words meaning and from uh, also looking at various translations. Press on, pursue, run after, chase, stretch forward, run toward the goal, straining toward what is ahead, straining toward what is ahead. These are the things that are in the modern translations and other things. This is what Paul is doing. Intense, intense about what's going on. He's intense. Ah, hey, quotable quote, quotable quote. Ah, you know, KH has some quotable quotes here. Do you know that? Here it goes. There is only one key to success. People say, what are the keys to success? Give me the keys. I have boiled it down. I make it easy for you. There's one key to success. Passionate pursuit with unwavering commitment. Passionate pursuit with unwavering commitment. Say that with me. Passionate pursuit with unwavering commitment. Pursue everything with relentless passion and commitment. Pursue everything with relentless passion and commitment. Be diligent, passionately pursue God, good, godly goals, and the great. And of course, that fast moving cheetah lets you know pursue with passion. That's my document that I have there. I'll make that available to you. Prayer. Look, Paul had a life of prayer. Colossians 4, I love this passage. Colossians 4, 2 through 4. I'll just hit the first part here. Devote yourselves to prayer. Be totally into it. Make your life a life of prayer. He says, devote yourself to prayer. And then in Colossians, more about the scriptures. First was Paul in his life. Now it's the scriptures. He talked about Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you. Also, here, I love this. Don't you love this? Laboring fervently for you in prayers. Look at Epaphras, a man of prayer. He hung around a man of prayer, and he got to be even more of a man of prayer. Fervent, fervently. Do you fervently? Do you really pray like with a lot of power and intensity? Wow. That'll help you bring about the future if you pray. Then finally, planning. You got the plan. Paul mentions his ministry plans several times in all the epistles. You can look here, you can there. You can see it here, there. I'll just give you a couple examples. Here he was. He says, for I'm passing through Macedonia. I want to come to you. I'm passing through Macedonia. I will stay with you for a while or even spend winter. He said, I'll plan on that. And then he goes on about his plan to visit Rome. For these reasons, I've often been hindered from coming to you. <clears throat> but there's no place more for me to work in these regions. He said, I've done most of my work here now. I've been longing to get with you for years. Paul had a plan that was several years ahead. Some of us can't plan past next week. You gotta get out of that. Be free, free to think of the future in years. He said, I plan to do also. He said, I plan to go to Spain. That's why when some do his uh, <clears throat> fourth missionary journey, some call it after being released from prison here where he wrote Philippians. And he said, I plan on going to Spain. Some say he actually made it there. Ah, <clears throat> persistence, this is the key. Paul was diligent in his calling. The righteous are as bold as a lion, Proverbs says. Yes, they're bold. But here's the thing. You've got to be persistent. You've got to keep going. You can't stop. Here is the key. We're going to talk about this. We're going to discuss this in our discussion time. So be prepared to think about it. <clears throat> Mid-course correction is a vital skill for success in carving out your future. Stay on course when being thrown off course. Yes. Stay in course when you're thrown off, it should be off course. Now, here we go. Mid-course correction, here's the definition and explanation. A mid-course correction is a change in direction, mostly coming after a crisis event or the event requires a turning point for a decision. We've got something has happened, you think you're marching along your way and then, my, 
right. This thing comes along. It is a correction, a navigational change that must happen. Sometimes, even though it's a conscious alteration, it's modification, it's a detour. But sometimes it may be a divine, divine intervention. This is what happened on Apollo 13. This was actually the 50th year. April was the month. <clears throat> they had an explosion on board. They had an explosion. One of the, oh man, explosion of oxygen? Oh no. Now, Houston, we have had a problem, he said. Yes. <clears throat> now, because of that, they lost that. They planned on just putting something on the moon and having a nice leisurely thing, but something happened. It threw it off. And when that happened, Man, they had to come up with new ideas. They had to do things they never did before. You see, it is a problem when you have to go with a mid-course correction. Look, he even said, I think we had some divine help in this flight. Many of you know that you need a mid-course correction. You need a mid-course correction to get back on where God has called you to. I just gave you a few little pictures here for fun, the lift off. Here's the, uh, the command module and the service module. Here's this thing, you might not see it, but I hope you take a look. This is the explosion it had. Here's the, here's the newspaper, talks about them being calm despite low reserves on oxygen. And here's the grid, successful splash down. Here are people helping them. Here's the key I want you to see. NASA and its other partners solved a problem never encountered before. Solved a problem never encountered before. That's what you can do. With God, you can solve problems you never encountered before. Here's this flight path with some planned kind of mid-course corrections. But then when they got here and this problem started happening, right about here, they had to come with a whole plan. They had to go around the backside of the moon without even hearing but what to do, they had to navigate without hearing from NASA. And they couldn't get too close to the moon, they would have crashed with its gravitational pull. But they were able to navigate. Let me tell you, you'll be able to navigate in your mid-course correction. You pray and say, Lord, help me with my mid-course correction. You know, the Apostle Paul had a mid-course correction. And because of that, we have the book of Philippians, we have Thessalonians, we have Corinthians. Because he wanted to go in this way, Asia. But the spirit said, no, do you listen to the spirit? Or you just do your own thing. <laughs> he wanted to go to Asia. No. Then he wanted to go by Finney. He said, well, if I can't go this way, I'll go that way. The Lord said, no, listen to the spirit. But at Troas, he's over here. He goes up around this way. He stops at Troas. And that's when the man says, come over to Macedonia and help us. And that's because the mid-course correction of the Holy Ghost, the mid-course correction of the Holy Ghost. Fabulous. He was at Macedonia, that's Philippi, that's Nica. Then Greece, where he went to Corinth and Athens. Here he was. Look at look at Paul. He did all this. He made all this because he made a mid-course correction. You must master that. Your life will not be what it's supposed to be. You're saying to yourself, how come I'm not with, with God? How come God is not doing this? No, you have to do some things. You have to do some things. First of all, listen to God. We put us in prayer, but you've got to not only pray, you have to persist. Here's your assignment, should you wish to accept it. It is a question to ponder, perhaps even an act to act upon. What is it? Here's the general question. Do you believe you can create the future? Many Christians don't like that idea. Do you believe you can create your future? Do you believe you can create the future of others? If so, why do you feel you can or cannot create yours or others' future? Ah, if you believe you can create the future, do like Paul, strive purposefully through prayer, planning, and persistence. Pursue with passion, pursue with passion. This future is there, but you must create it. Here's what I said down here. If you believe you can't create the future, best of luck. I hope you make it. I hope you get somewhere in life. Every successful person believes they can control, not only just look at it, the control comes otherwise, but they believe they can create the future. What do you think? We're gonna put that question out for you. What do you think? My God, isn't that going to be quite a thing? Creating? The future? Wow, what a concept, what an idea, what a God.
What a thing that God has put in you, the ability, because you're a human. And because you know him, you can create the future. Ah, I know the plans I have for you. The future. God bless you. I love you. Oh, man, I'm looking forward to discussion on this. I'm seeing what are y'all going to say about your future?